Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we sift through the flotsam and jetsam of the last week on the Vatican Beat and excavate, extrapolate, and then explicate those few nuggets of gold that you really need to know in order to understand what's going on in Rome and the broader church. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with safety dance, how an apparent success story in terms of papal security illustrates how popes just think differently about their personal safety than, say, presidents, prime ministers, or other potentates of the planet. Secondly, we've got the sound of silence, how a fairly ham-handed attempt to sort of muzzle or silence an Italian blog that covers the Vatican and church affairs illustrates the inevitable boomerang effect of any attempt at censorship. We will explain. Third up this week, we have got late but not never, how the Vatican belatedly has weighed in to a burgeoning Italian debate over abortion. We'll explain what's at stake and what the Vatican has said. Fourth, this week, we've got taking responsibility. How Pope Francis has now created a provision in Vatican law that allows an individual person to sue for judicial malpractice will tease out the question of whether that actually might have some implications for the recently concluded Vatican trial of the century. Finally, this week, we've got a controversial confirmation. Speaking of that trial of the century, the star prosecution witness has been confirmed in his Vatican gig. We'll explain why some people see this as a totally appropriate defense of a whistleblower. Other people wonder if this is a payoff for some fairly dubious testimony. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, do not go anywhere, because we will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, April 23rd in the year of our Lord, 2024. Today is the feast day of St. George the Martyr, and that actually has enormous significance here in the Vatican, because in the Vatican, they do not celebrate the Pope's birthday. Instead, they celebrate what is known as the Pope's onomastico, that is, the, the name day of his saint. And of course, Jorge in Spanish means George. 
And so today is the onomastico of Pope Francis, which means this is an official national holiday in the Vatican City State. Practically speaking, that means if you work in the Vatican, you don't have to show up at work today. Now, I would note that in Italy, Thursday of this week is the Festa della Liberazione, the National Liberation Day, celebrating the liberation of Italy from Nazi occupation in 1945. So you've got a Vatican holiday on Tuesday and a national Italian holiday on Thursday. For many Vatican employees who are also Italians, this creates what the Italians like to call una ponte, a bridge between two different holidays, which means for this entire week, there are going to be lots of Italians in the Vatican who don't show up for work. So if you're expecting some big development out of the Vatican this week, if it depends on the workforce of the Vatican, it ain't going to happen. Now, if it depends on Pope Francis personally, that is a completely different story. All right? So, in any event, let's get started. Because for us, like even though most Italians in the Vatican may not be doing jack this week, we are still on the job. So, let us begin. We begin with safety dance. So, there was a kind of curious story out of the Vatican in recent days. Last week, at the Pope's general audience on Wednesday, Italian police arrested a character they regarded as suspicious who had shown up in St. Peter's Square for the audience, a guy by the name of Moises Tejada, who they thought was sort of behaving in a strange fashion, and so they observed him for a while, and then finally pulled him aside and discovered that he had in his possession three knives. So this is a guy who was in St. Peter's Square waiting for the papal audience who was packing three different knives on his body. They, so having discovered that, the Italian security forces took him into custody, fingerprinted him, you know, ran the ID. Turned out this guy is on New York State's most wanted list because a few years ago he had been arrested for... Basically, he posed as a potential buyer of a real estate property in New York. Then he tied up the real estate agent, beat him up, and stole the guy's car. He was arrested and convicted. He was sentenced to a prison in New York. Then he was given parole, but he never showed up for his parole meeting, so he violated his parole. New York put him on the most wanted list. And then, you know, he ends up being arrested in St. Peter's Square. He told the Italian cops who had arrested him because they found out that he had entered Italy through Moldavia. He told them he had actually been in Ukraine fighting the Russians on behalf of the Ukrainians, and that's why he was packing these knives. It is completely unclear if he intended to pose any threat to Pope Francis at all. What is striking is that the Italian security people have been falling over one another to pat themselves on the back for having intercepted this guy. They are congratulating themselves for this historic, you know, act of preserving the Pope's personal safety. Thing of it is, this guy was in St. Peter's Square carrying knives before anybody realized that he was even there. And let me just point out that it was a complete fluke that that even happened. Now, what I wanna, the point I wanna make is this, that what this story illustrates really is that the security membrane the security barrier around a pope is much thinner than it is for other global figures. And I'm going to tell a small personal story that illustrates this point. So in 2002, my wife, Lisa, and I, we had been married in Florida, in Key West, in January. And we wanted to go to what the Vatican calls the Sposi Novelli. That is, this, this thing where at the Wednesday general audience, people who have just been married can show up wearing their wedding clothes, and they can get a blessing from the Pope. And it's a kind of, if you're very Catholic and you're in Rome and you get married, it's something you want to do. Okay? Now, we had planned to do this shortly after our wedding. However, when we got back from our wedding, that was right when the COVID lockdown in Italy happened. So all the public audiences were suspended. So we weren't able to do it right away. So the first time that the Pope celebrated a public audience after these COVID lockdowns 
we decided we were gonna go. I mean, technically you're supposed to do this within two months of your marriage, but of course, given the COVID situation, we weren't able to do that. We figured we could be grandfathered in. So we decided this particular Wednesday, the Pope was doing an audience in a courtyard within the Vatican in order to keep crowd size small, but they were still gonna do this Wesley Novelli thing. So we decided we were gonna go. Me being me, I carried both our civil and our church wedding certificates to prove that we had actually been married. And, you know, we had all our ID. You know, I had my American passport, my Italian, Carta di Identità, the Italian, I had everything, right? Here's the thing. Elise was in her wedding gown. I was in my wedding suit. We walked up. They waved us through. Nobody asked for any proof that we had actually just been married. They escorted us immediately to the front row in this cortile where we sat down. And before very long, there's the Pope. He comes over. Like, nobody did any security scan. We didn't have to go through a metal detector. Nobody patted us down. Nothing. Okay? We were never wanted. And there we were. And the Pope comes over. We had a nice chat. It was a lovely moment. We have pictures of it all over my house. But point is this. Like, I could have been carrying an RPG. Okay, I could have had a dirty bomb in my possession, and no one in the Vatican would have been the wiser. Now, how do we explain what, you know, from a certain point of view, could seem a fairly lax approach to security? Well, if you like, you could say this is simply Italy being Italy, where they take a more relaxed attitude towards many things that the rest of the world tends to be a little bit more severe about. Okay, that's fine. You know, you could say, look, Popes are not politicians. They are pastors. They want to be as close to their people as possible. That's also true. However, I would insist on this. But popes have a somewhat different perspective about their personal safety than other world leaders do because they believe ultimately it is not in the hands of man. It is in the hands of God. I would remind you that on May 13, 1981, Pope John Paul II was profoundly convinced that the Virgin, that was also the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, by the way. He was profoundly convinced that the Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, changed the flight path of a bullet fired by his would be assassin, Mohammed Ali Ajka, in order to preserve his life and to preserve his papacy. Now, if that is your worldview, that you believe that ultimately your destiny is not exclusively in the hands of human agents, but it also you know, depends upon divine providence, then I think you're probably going to have a different attitude towards your security arrangements than many other potentates and, you know, powerful titans of the earth may have. And I think we probably saw evidence of that this week. We will see evidence of it throughout the rest of this papacy and every papacy to follow because popes simply are different animals than other world leaders. All right. Second up this week, we've got the sound of silence. So this past week, a Vatican tribunal, after a hearing that lasted less than an hour, dismissed a defamation case against an Italian blog that is titled Silere non posso, which is a Latin phrase that translates to I cannot remain silent. This blog is operated by a young Italian Catholic by the name of Marco Felipe Perfetti, and it's kind of stock in trade. Perfetti, by the way, has an academic background in both canon and civil law. And the stock in trade of this blog is basically, oh, I guess, making a mockery of different figures in the Vatican power structure, whom Perfetti and the other people who, you know, he's brought together to operate this blog would regard as charlatans, incompetence, whatever. Okay. Now, this particular accusation of defamation against Perfetti was brought by an Italian layman by the name of Angelo Chiorizzato, Chiora, Chiorizzato, who is a, basically a businessman and a politician in southern Italy, in Basilicata. He was actually briefly a candidate to become governor of the southern region of Basilicata. And he complained that this site, Solere Non Possum, was <laughs> raising questions about his relationship 
with Cardinal Mauro Gambetti, who is the head of the Basilica of San Pietro and the administration of the Basilica of San Pietro, and also a Franciscan priest by the name of Enzo Fortunato, who was the spokesperson for the Basilica of San Pietro. And it is entirely true. This blog, Solere Non Possum, has sort of made a mockery of Gambetti and Fortunato. Basically, Profete in his crowd sees Cardinal Gambetti, who was the Franciscan superior in Assisi before he got named as a cardinal and was given charge of St. Peter's, and Fortunato, who was the spokesperson for Assisi. Solere Non Possum sees these guys as basically, you know, he thinks they're running a racket, okay? That they're basically more interested in money than they are spirituality, and he has said this multiple times on his site. So, this guy, Chiorizzato, has had made this accusation against these guys, and the Vatican Court had a hearing. At the end of this hearing, the presiding judge, Giuseppe Pignatoni, said, we don't have jurisdiction because the alleged crime didn't occur on Vatican territory, it occurred in Italy. The alleged criminal is not a Vatican citizen, he's an Italian citizen. And the media platform that he represents is not in the Vatican, but it's an Italian thing. And so there's nothing to do here. Now, think of it is, you have to ask the question, why did the prosecutor, the Vatican prosecutor, Alessandro Didi, bring this charge in the first place? Because here's the thing, the boomerang effect. Anytime, okay, let me just say this. Basic memo to anybody who is in power, the greatest gift you could ever give to any media outlet or to any commentator is to create the impression that you are afraid of them. If you do that, you are going to increase their audience way beyond anything that their natural capacity would generate. Let me point out that Solare de Non Possum, if you go on to X, right, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, they've got a following right now of about 4,100 people. Now, I don't want to suggest that's nothing. But by comparison, I have 36,000 followers on Twitter and I haven't sent a tweet in years, okay? Like, so the point is, this is a fairly small niche outlet that the Vatican, in the form of prosecutor, uh, Alessandro Aditi, has suddenly given an audience because of this rather ham-handed effort to muzzle them at the behest of an Italian entrepreneur and politician who simply didn't like what they had to say. In other words, memo to people in power, including the Vatican, if you are bothered by something that has been said or published about you, let it go. Just let it go, because it will die a natural death. If you try to punish it, it is inevitably going to create a much bigger audience for it. Proof of which is, have I talked about anything Solere Non Possum ever said about anyone in the Vatican prior to today? The answer is no. However, I am obligated to do so now because the Vatican has given all this legs by taking it seriously. All right, that's the moral of the story. Third, this week, late but not never. So there is a burgeoning abortion debate in Italy, not over whether abortion should be legal. Abortion was legalized here in Italy in 1978 under what is known as Law 194, and nobody is seriously questioning whether that should be changed. However, recently, the conservative Italian government under Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has made a proposal regarding abortion policy. Basically, what it boils down to is this. Under the Italian abortion law, abortion is legal for pretty much any reason during the first trimester, that is the first 90 days of pregnancy. After that, you have to be able to demonstrate either a threat to the life of the mother or a threat to the development of the fetus in order to just find abortion. What that means is that Italian women have to obtain a certificate from a medical professional attesting to the state of their pregnancy before they can have an abortion. Now, they can get that from their GP, their general practitioner, they can get it from their gynecologist, or they can go to a family planning clinic, a publicly funded family planning clinic where they can go and have a consultation and then get this certificate about somewhere between 60 or 70% of Italian women who have abortions, that's how they do it, okay, is they go to one of these clinics. And in these clinics, the people who run the place are obligated by law 
to present women with a series of options. They can say, well, listen, before you do this, if you want to talk to this person or that person or whatever, you can do that. The, the conservative government has proposed that among the resources that would be presented to women in these clinics would be pro-life groups. That is, groups that, you know, whose mission is to try to persuade women not to have abortions, but instead to take advantage of other resources that could be provided to them. Now, the conservative government has argued that that is simply consistent with the spirit of the original 1978 law, which said that the state, among other things, ought to provide options to women in difficulty who didn't actually want to have an abortion, but who simply felt they had no other choice. Critics, however, have argued that this is a kind of backhanded attempt to restrict the right to abortion. It has created a kind of burgeoning political debate here in Italy. One of the interesting things about this debate is that it's been brewing for more than a month, but until very recently, no one in the Italian Bishops' Conference and no one in the Vatican had said anything about it. And that was perceived as a result of the fact that there has been a kind of very complicated and difficult relationship between the Italian bishops and the pro-life movements in this country, who some in the Italian Bishops' Conference believe are too aggressive, too militant, and, quite frankly, too American. They think these pro-life groups are getting money and inspiration from pro-life groups in the United States, whom they find to be just, I don't know, what, too over the top. And so there's always been a kind of hands-off thing. However, over the weekend, Italian Cardinal Pietro Paterlin, who was the Vatican's Secretary of State, basically the Pope's top deputy, was speaking at a conference at Roman University. He was asked a question about this abortion debate, and what he said was basically, I don't want to go into the technical details of what's going on, but, he said, we are pro-life. We are in favor of the defense of life, and we are in favor of any mechanism or any institution that would afford women the opportunity to preserve life. Now, even though that might be seen as a fairly innocent or banal reiteration of what has been long-standing Vatican policy, in the context of the current debate, that was seen as the Vatican taking the side of the Maloney government, the center-right government that is in charge here in Italy, and basically backing up this proposal to include pro-life groups in the resources offered to pregnant women. Look, the status of this proposal is that the lower house of the Italian parliament has already approved it. It is currently before the Senate, but the Senate is widely expected to approve it since it is controlled by the center right. Maloney will obviously sign off. So this thing seems destined to become law. The real question is, is that actually going to make any difference in terms of the decisions women make about whether to have an abortion or whether to carry their pregnancy to term? That we will have to see. I will simply say this, that statistics show that every year about 10 to 15,000 more Italian women go to a family planning clinic than end up having abortions. In other words, the experience of going to the clinic, at least in some cases, does appear to persuade women that they have other options. We will see how all of this plays out. All right, next up this week, we have taking responsibility. So Pope Francis, who of course loves nothing more than issuing what are known as motu proprio, that is amendments to Vatican and Catholic law on his own personal initiative, issued yet another motu proprio this past week which changed Vatican law with regard to magistrates. That is a term in Italian, i magistrati, which includes both judges who sit on Vatican courts, also prosecutors who are kind of quasi-judicial figures who investigate and prosecute crimes under Vatican law. And basically, I mean, you know, this overhaul had certain other aspects. It established mandatory retirement ages of 75 for lay judges, 80 for cardinal judges. It said that you know, judges who retire will participate in the Vatican pension system. And, you know, I mean, all of that is sort of housekeeping. But the thing that is most interesting is that Pope Francis 
overhauled Vatican law so that it parallels Italian law in creating the possibility that individual citizens can sue the Vatican for judicial misconduct. That is, if you have been prosecuted and convicted by a Vatican tribunal, but you believe that that prosecution and conviction was unjust, that it was a result of corruption or malpractice or, or something else, you can actually file a lawsuit. Now, under the law, you cannot sue the individual judge or prosecutor. They are protected in order to guarantee their independence. But you can sue the state, in this case, the Vatican City state. And if you prevail in your lawsuit, then the state, in turn, can go after the judge or prosecutor whose misconduct gave rise to the cause of action. Damages are capped at one half of the judge, judge's or prosecutor's annual salary. But, you know, the broader point is that it creates a way to hold judges and prosecutors accountable for their conduct. Now, as I say, at one level, this does nothing more than bring the Vatican into compliance with law that has existed in Italy since 1988. Basically, what happened is that prior to 1987, in Italy, it was impossible to sue a judge or a prosecutor. But there was this famous case in 1987 where an Italian journalist was indicted and convicted by a court in southern Italy that everybody thought had been bought off by the mob. He was convicted on the testimony of mob members. Everyone saw this as illegitimate. He was eventually completely acquitted by the Italian Supreme Court. And on the back of that, Italy created a system where you could sue for judicial malpractice. Now, the same possibility has been written into Vatican law. Now, what is most interesting is that the Vatican's trial of the century, this trial for alleged financial crime involving a $400 million property deal in London that ended with convictions of nine defendants, including a former a cardinal, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, the Pope's former chief of staff. Becciu has consistently argued that he has been the victim of judicial malpractice. So, you know, assuming he runs through his appeals, under the Vatican system, he may actually be the very first guy to take advantage of this possibility and to file a suit against the Vatican's chief prosecutor, Alessandro Didi, which means, ladies and gentlemen, that the trial of the century, which we all thought was basically over, this may be like one of those Freddy Krueger horror movies where he is back, baby. He rises from the mat and has the knife once again in his hands. We'll see how all this plays out. All right, finally this week, a controversial confirmation. The star witness in that trial of the century, Italian Monsignor Alberto Prelasca, this week was confirmed in his role as an adjunct prosecutor with the Vatican Supreme Court, the Apostolic Signatura by Pope Francis. Now, there was no formal Vatican announcement to that effect, but it, news of it kind of got out. It has been reported widely in the Italian press and never denied, therefore, in effect, confirmed by the Vatican. Now, fans of this will say, hey, Perlaska, you know, was the star witness in this trial. He was a whistleblower. It's entirely appropriate that, you know, he would continue to be guaranteed Vatican employment. On the other hand, critics will say, hey, wait a minute. Perlaska was the guy in the Secretary of State who originally put together the London deal that triggered this prosecution. He only escaped prosecution because he decided to, like, throw his erstwhile colleagues and superiors under the bus. And further, during the course of the trial, it turned out he had been coached in his testimony by somebody, Francesca Chalqui, who had been convicted in the Vatican League's 2.0 trial for leaking confidential Vatican information to journalists and is a figure. Well, to call her, like, contested or controversial would, you know, be like calling the surface of the sun a little bit warm, like an understatement, right? And so for critics, you know, what they would say is what this amounts to is a payoff for a guy who gave the prosecution in the Vatican what it wanted to hear, despite the fact that there are real and persistent doubts 
about how seriously you ought to take that testimony. We will obviously continue to follow how this story unfolds. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for being with us. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel, with all the latest and greatest on the Vatican beat. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic week, and we will talk to you again very soon.